this particular map is a product of the young doctor movements uh, of Wonka. Uh, they asked family doctors uh, globally to say, how do you say family doctor in your language and produce this lovely word map? Uh, I, I wanted to start with uh, a little bit of political news from Canada because clearly political will is very important in influencing the funding and organization of primary care and that's a tremendous challenge in India as well as elsewhere. Uh, we've just had an election in Canada and we have a new cabinet uh, and uh, the cabinet includes uh, four individuals uh, of Indian heritage including you can see our Minister of Defense is one of those and he's in the back row. Uh, half of the cabinet are women, and two of the 30 cabinet members are family doctors. Wow. <laughs> the media asked our new Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, why he had constructed uh, a cabinet like this with gender equity and ethnic diversity and tremendous uh, skills, and his answer was, because it's 2015. And I mm. thought, exactly, let's get up to date. Um, I'm not going to talk about why Canada is amongst the best healthcare systems in the world because I think that's a boast that I would not want to stand behind. I think we have a very good healthcare system and I know it's very popular and dearly treasured by Canadians. But I, w I will tell you about our healthcare system and the contribution that family physicians make to healthcare in Canada. I've, uh, you've heard my story and I have no commercial disclosures. Uh, and again, another word cloud of your lovely Taj Mahal. Uh, and here's what the word cloud for Canada looks like. This is what family doctors in Canada said about their work. And you'll see words like babies, diversity, collaboration, and of course some words in French because we're a bilingual country. All right, here's a map of uh, how countries around the world uh, manage their healthcare systems. And the countries um, which are colored with the exception of the US, all have universal health care or, or are aspiring to do so. The countries that are in a purple color have universal health care that is um, taxpayer funded, uh, funded out of tax revenues. Those are, that are in green are funded through a variety of insurance uh, systems. So this shows you that Canada has a universal health coverage which is publicly funded. And we love to talk about Margaret Chan in family medicine because she is such a friend of ours. But she talks about the importance of universal health coverage as the single most powerful concept that public health has to offer. That's an amazing statement. And so one of the strengths of the Canadian healthcare system is that we do offer universal health coverage. Health, uh, home health care, for example, in Canada is publicly funded. Uh, so it's a service that's provided, but provided out of taxpayer support. Not that we can't learn from India, because I certainly don't have a mobile app when I make a house call. So, Canadian primary care, publicly funded, free at the point of access, but privately provided. And uh, this is a, a distinction that some people have difficulty understanding. As a family physician, when I see patients, the payment for the services that I provide comes from government to me, but how I use the funding that comes to me is under my own control. So I can, uh, uh, if I wish, hire staff, I can uh, uh, purchase my supplies, uh, set my own hours, set the pace of how often I see patients, uh, and that's under my control. The negative side, of course, is that I have no pension, no benefits. Uh, I'm a, a private entrepreneur, if you like. So publicly funded, but privately provided. Uh, most Canadians do have a family doctor, and they're free to choose whichever family doctor they wish. Those who don't have a family doctor tend to either feel they don't need one, or in some parts of the country, particularly rural and isolated areas, we have uh, a shortage of family physicians. Um, and I think in many ways, we've, we were talking earlier, there are similarities between India and Canada because we have a need for well-trained family physicians in urban areas, but also in small hospitals where they need procedural skills, and then in very remote and isolated parts of our country uh, where they have a, a tremendous scope of practice. We have a, I think we're behind uh, India in many ways in terms of uptake of electronic medical records, and our medical records are not very interoperable between hospital and, and primary care. Half of our doctors are family doctors. And uh, I have no evidence as to why this is the good ratio, but we have had this uh, ratio for many years in our country and it work, seems to work well. So I would recommend it to you. 
Uh, we have sadly not been self-sufficient in production of family doctors, and so like you, we have uh, had a shortage and we've relied on international medical graduates. So not just in family medicine, but across our profession, 25% of our graduates are international medical graduates. We are a country of immigrants, so we're, we welcome them, um, and we are trying to become more self-sufficient. Another key aspect of the strength of the Canadian primary care system is that family doctors have a gatekeeper role. So although it is absolutely the case that we can handle by far the majority of the complaints that come to us, uh, referrals to other physicians must go through the family physician. And that gatekeeper role, of course, drives people uh, to us and also uh, ensures good relationships with our other specialty colleagues. Uh, we have a comprehensive scope of care. So this is me delivering a baby. Uh, the, the woman is a medical student. The man is one of our residents. This patient I had known since uh, she was 10 years old, and she had appendicitis at age 11. And I had always been worried about her fertility. And indeed, she did have difficulty conceiving. Uh, so when she finally became pregnant, uh, it was a very uh, joyful day for me to, uh, to wait and be present at the delivery of her first child. And at the other end of life, uh, this is a picture of me making a house call. Uh, you see, I do not have the mobile app. Uh, I do have the hand, uh, holding the hand of my patient. She's blind, um, uh, but we seem to be communicating in some way. Uh, so, a full scope of practice. Uh, the practice of a family doctor in Canada is dependent on the context. So in the urban setting, the need for procedures uh, is much less, and we would have more of an ambulatory role, uh, a home health care role, certainly. Uh, in small hospitals, um, very commonly family physicians will uh, provide inpatient care, emergency room care, uh, and in remote and isolated parts of our country, uh, surgical interventions. So that's one of the uh, uh, tremendous features of well-trained, skilled generalists is that we're adaptable to the context in which we work and provide the skills that are needed in our communities. Canada has good health care outcomes, and I can't claim that, that family medicine is responsible for uh, anything more than a small part of that because, of course, the social determinants of health are very important and very key. But I like to think we have some influence over health outcomes, and I'll show you some evidence in a moment. Um, People like to, um, in Canada, we often compare ourselves to the US. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the downsides of Canada's publicly funded system is that you can't buy your way to the front of the line. So if you have more money, you can't get your hip replacement faster. You wait until uh, you rise on the list and get your hip replacement at that time. So more money does not buy you more health care. What it means is that we have longer waits for elective surgery in Canada than they do, for example, in the US, where it's possible to uh, get faster access depending on your economic means. So that's, uh, that rationing by wait times is, is part of what happens in Canada. Uh, we do have uh, high rates of doctor consultation in spite of that rationing. And you can see at the bottom, Canada has very high rates of visits per capita to family doctors, higher than Australia or the UK. So people can have pretty good access to their doctor. And just a reminder, of course, I'm talking about Canada, and I'm talking about access, but I'm very aware that globally, access to physicians is highly unequal, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. So I always uh, like to put up this slide, which shows the doctor population ratios throughout the world. Now, uh, doc Dr. Manning talked about uh, Barbara Starfield as the person we often like to quote, and I'm afraid I'm going to give you some Barbara Starfield now, and apologies if you've already heard it. Uh, here's work that's 20 years old now but has recently been replicated, and it shows that uh, the strength of a primary care system, uh, and in this case per capita health care expenditures, uh, countries with very strong primary care systems have um, lower per, health, per capita health expenditures, and a slide which I'm not going to show you shows that they have better health outcomes as well. And Starfield, one, a, a quote from Starfield is, what is needed is person-focused care over time, not disease-focused care. So she ranks countries on the attributes of family medicine, like person-centered care, continuity of care, comprehensiveness of care, and shows that countries that have that kind of health care system, which is what family doctors deliver, uh, has benefits for the health care system overall. And we've replicated this here in, in, uh, in Canada. In British Columbia, the more 
patients were firmly attached to family doctors and primary care settings, the lower their health care costs, in this case for diabetes and congestive heart failure, were overall for health care systems. So the better the attachment and the primary care they get, the lower the cost for the services overall. And that's why the argument to politicians is invest in us, fund us in primary care, and the outcomes for the health care system uh, and for population health overall will be better. And Margaret Chan again. You saw this slide earlier. And there she is, holding our guidebook that Dr. Manning referred to. So if you want more of this kind of evidence to make the argument to policymakers and politicians, uh, I would recommend the guidebook to you. These are, the, these are the characteristics that we've already talked about. Now, a little bit about how to strengthen family medicine by just reflecting on our history in Canada. Uh, we founded our College of Family Physicians in 1954, and to become a member of the College of Family Physicians, you could be a GP, and most, of, most people were GPs without postgraduate training. If you joined, the one requirement was that you committed to doing annual continuing medical education and reporting that to the college. We were the first professional body in Canada to do that. And for many years, um, residency programs started very slowly, as they are here in India. Uh, uh, many people did not take advantage or were not able to get uh, residency training in family medicine. I was one of them. I did an internship and then some additional anesthesia and then some additional obstetrics and a short family medicine rotation. But what we, what we allowed in Canada was the ability to challenge the examinations in family medicine out of a practice eligible route. So we welcomed in GPs who wanted to improve their skills through CME and then who wanted to become family doctors and certified as family doctors by challenging the examinations. The residency programs became established in the 1970s, and by the mid-1990s, so about 20 years ago, the only route to becoming licensed to be a family doctor became through uh, the residency training as opposed to the practice eligible route. Then we had a shortage of family doctors. Uh, we had uh, um, uh, and, and a need to reopen the practice eligible route, particularly to allow international medical graduates to certify in family medicine. And then since then, we've had a reinvestment and, and more uh, family medicine residency spots uh, becoming available. So I thought that might be of interest to you as you think about your own growth and how to be inclusive and move family medicine forward. Uh, the other point I would make about our college is that um, the college in, uh, encompasses uh, really the whole breadth of what one needs to strengthen family medicine. So we accredit the training programs, we set the certification exams, we set the standards for continuing professional development, we uh, allow physicians to track their continuing professional development through us, the academics in family medicine are part of the college and have a home within it. The researchers in family medicine are also part of the college, and we have an important um, role in, in uh, supporting practice and policy in family medicine. So that whole suite of activities, all of which is required to move family medicine forward, we found was very well supported by a, a voluntary professional association which came up through the grassroots and became our College of Family Physicians. Now, I wanted to talk just briefly about how is it that primary care works? What is it, what's the magic that makes um, family medicine so good for healthcare systems? And if you haven't read this book, I would recommend it to you, The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better. And here's one graph from that book, which shows that, uh, it shows to start with something that all of us know, which is the richer you are, the more healthy you tend to be, and the poor tend to have uh, poorer health status than the rich. But it turns out that if you're rich in a country which has a great deal of inequality, you're worse off than if you're rich in a more egalitarian country. So inequality in a country is bad for the health of the poor, but also bad for the health of the rich. And it's not just health which is affected. Uh, look at some of the other uh, indicators on the slide. Uh, incarceration, teenage births, obesity, social mobility, infant mortality, uh, all of these are affected by inequality uh, in a country. So, of course, we need policies of justice uh, which decrease inequality in our countries, um, but primary care has a role to play. 
So some of this has been uh, summarized by Starfield, and what she shows is that if you can increase primary care, you can help overcome the effects of inequality in a country. In this particular uh, case, she talks about uh, diagnosing late-stage colorectal cancer, and, and the outcomes are worse if you have more specialty physicians than primary care physicians, because specialty physicians may not focus on screening or prevention. Um, she also talks about the impact of seeing many different physicians. So the more different specialists you see, the higher total costs. The more different generalists you see, higher medical costs and diagnostic tests and interventions. And even the more generalists you see, uh, the, uh, the worse you are off. So you want, to, you want to have a primary care system that has as much generalist continuity as possible, that person-centered care. And here Starfield shows that um, if you have areas of low in income inequality and high primary care resources, you can certainly uh, make differences here. She shows it for postnatal mortality. And the effects are even more striking in areas of high income inequality. So the point is that that person-centered, continuous, accessible primary care is good for everybody, but it's particularly good in areas, in counties, in cities where there is a high degree of income inequality. So the good work we do helps to overcome the effects of inequity. Similarly, showing it for uh, stroke mortality. So in, in summary, the primary care uh, evidence-based summary is that countries with strong primary care have lower costs, generally have healthier populations. And within countries, if you have higher primary care physician availability and not specialist availability, you have better health outcomes. When people, not diseases, are the focus of attention, outcomes are better, side effects are fewer, costs are lower, and population health is greater. Here's a license plate you could maybe sell. Everyone deserves a family physician. Uh, I put this in just uh, because it's from Canada and people maybe like to see igloos. Maybe, maybe you feel cooler if you see an igloo. My husband and I practiced in uh, Nunavut, which is one of our northern territories. But just to remind uh, myself to say to you what I mentioned earlier, that the context of our practice really affects the content. So you never know exactly what a family doctor does until you ask her about her patients and about where she's practicing. And we are adaptable to meet the needs of that community, both in our medical skills and in our leadership uh, in promoting public health within those communities. So that's my uh, talk. I wanted to uh, conclude by again looking at the global perspective of this uh, magnificent family medicine movement that we're building around the world. Uh, I have the uh, honor of being on the Waka World Executive and learning about family medicine globally. And I hope this perspective that I've given you from Canada will encourage you in your, uh, in your wonderful uh, efforts here in India. Thank you. <laughs>